United States stands at this time at the pinnacle of world power. It is a solemn moment for the American democracy. For with primacy in power is also joined an awe-inspiring accountability to the future. At the heart of U.S. foreign policy is a deep-seated ambivalence. Some American leaders, believing that global problems must have global solutions, have put their faith in institutions with worldwide mandates. Others have derided those same organizations as ineffectual and have asserted that America ought to stand alone. Great Decisions examines the perils and promises of multilateralism and asks whether global cooperation can endure in an era of nationalist retrenchment. The end of the global order? Next on Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. Every four years, American voters head to the polls to elect a president. At issue is not just who will occupy the White House, but how actively the U.S. will engage with the rest of the world. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. America is back, ready to lead the world, not retreat from it. In his four years in office, President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of a host of multilateral institutions. The Trump administration announced today that it will withdraw the U.S. from UNESCO, the United Nations body that protects global cultural heritage, in response to its designation of the old city of Hebron as a Palestinian World Heritage Site. In a joint statement this afternoon, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley said the U.S. will no longer participate in the U.N. Human Rights Council. Today, President Trump formally notified Congress of his intent to withdraw the U.S. from the World Health Organization, the international agency responsible for fighting disease. One of the things that the United States is, is we're still the biggest player on the block. Now we shouldn't yield to the second biggest or the third biggest or, or worse. We need to pick our alliances carefully, make sure that there are enough shared values that we can feel comfortable with that partnership. The United States stepping back from that position of international leadership loses US influence. If we leave the table, there are other countries who are quite happy to take our seat. Three quarters of a century has passed since the end of World War II ushered in a new system of multilateral commitments. Now, in an era of rising nationalism, the institutions that were built to bring the world together are being tested. Now, I've been worrying about different aspects of the world for some time and have concluded that we are now on a hinge of history sort of comparable to what the people at the end of World War II faced. I think going forward, the real question is, what is, what is the norm? Is the last 75 years the norm and Donald Trump the aberration? Or in some ways, was the last 75 years something of the exception and Donald Trump was a harbinger of a return to America's tradition of holding back from the world? I don't have the answer to that, but a lot of history will depend on that answer. Today, the General Assembly will take up sub-item A of Agenda Item 105 of the election of 14 members of the Human Rights Council. In 2006, the UN approved the formation of a body dedicated to the protection of human rights around the world. 
but George W. Bush kept the U.S. out of this new council. The idea was that it had been become so dominated by anti-human rights members that it was, uh, it was nowhere close to fulfilling its mission. It was clear that it would only be a matter of time before the new Human Rights Council would have the same defects as its predecessor. And that's exactly what happened. There really isn't a whole lot of, uh, of evidence in terms of impact uh, of the Human Rights Council in terms of addressing grave human rights situations around the world. The tough cases, those are the ones that the Human Rights Council needs to be focused on, and those countries often ignore the Human Rights Council, even if they're a subject of its resolutions at all. When President Barack Obama took office in 2009, the U.S. finally joined the U.N. Human Rights Council. The logic behind the Obama administration being in the U.N. Uh, Council on Human Rights is to be at the table to try to make it better. It is very fraught, but if we aren't there, then our voice is not there, our values are not there, our purpose is not there. This was not a naive, idealistic decision. This was based on a very pragmatic assessment of the costs and benefits of engagement versus non-engagement. The idea that the United States would cede leadership on human rights without even taking a shot at this new institution, I think that that was just untenable for the Obama administration. After eight contentious years, experts disagreed whether U.S. participation had paid dividends. And I'm proud to say that today, the Obama administration's leadership at the Human Rights Council has delivered real results. They were successful at the margins. Uh, they were able to make some resolutions uh, less troublesome or, or less onerous or less uh, hypocritical than they otherwise might have been. But again, you still don't see the Human Rights Council under the Obama administration truly focus on those countries that need to be criticized. You didn't see resolutions condemning Cuba. You didn't see resolutions condemning Russia. You didn't see resolutions condemning China. The results of our engagement at the Human Rights Council uh, far exceeded anyone's wildest dreams. We had four special sessions on Syria. We were very engaged in the creation of a commission of inquiry on North Korea, LGBT rights we got onto the agenda, and that had been inconceivable just a short time earlier. I think there's a real question, absent U.S. leadership on the Human Rights Council, whether the Human Rights Council ever would have set up uh, a human rights special rapporteur for Iran to actually investigate and hold accountable the Iranian government for its human rights abuses domestically at a time when the U.N. Security Council was blocked by the Russian veto. In 2018, President Trump reversed course. Once again, the U.S. refused to take part. When I arrived, and still today, its members included some of the worst human rights violators. The dictatorships of Cuba, China, and Venezuela all have seats on the council. Another criticism. Uh, that the Trump administration made of the Human Rights Council is that it is biased against Israel. And that is evidently true. If you take a look at the number of condemnatory resolutions passed by the Human Rights Council, nearly half of them are focused on Israel. To think that Israel is the source of half of the world's human rights problems is simply ridiculous. China has never been criticized or been the subject of a condemnatory resolution by the Human Rights Council. I think taking human rights seriously is important. You don't have to do that through a council that, that's two principal targets are Israel and the United States. I'm not saying the U.S. has a perfect record on human rights, but we're a democracy. I mean, we're, we're presumably capable of correcting these problems ourselves. We don't need a nanny in Geneva lecturing us. The way the U.N. Human Rights Council has is, is evolved is, is a travesty. Um, and I can see why the Trump administration would say, uh, we're not gonna have anything more to do with this. The question is, does it help? Do you wanna throw your toys out of the pram and just not be there at all? I think the view of the British government is it's better to be inside fighting that case than to say, we leave. 
With the U.S. on the sidelines, China worked tirelessly to expand its influence within the UN Human Rights Council. Those efforts secured international support for controversial policies in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. There was a recent episode where China was successful in building a coalition to support its narrative about its role in Hong Kong. And this is a perfect example of where if the United States had been present, we would have uh, been able to work the halls and find more country support and really change the narrative about whether China actually does have the support of the majority of countries. What we've seen in recent years is China increasingly using its vast economic leverage to try to bring countries to its side within the UN. It's not facing much competition. It's incumbent on liberal democratic nations that believe in human rights to mobilize coalitions of countries so that China can't just waltz into the United Nations uh, mobilize its coalition and then go uncontested. American policymakers who hope to challenge China's global ambitions must determine whether to work inside or outside of existing institutions. The universal principle, I believe, is this. If America unilaterally withdraws from the UN and multilateral institutions, it simply creates a bigger slice for major non-democracies like China to exercise even greater influence in the future. Far better the United States remains in and prosecutes in each of these agencies a uh, general reform program to make them as effective and as efficient as possible. Multilateral organizations are always going to have a hard time agreeing on certain principles because you have this diversity of cultures and values and forms of government. I mean, you know, on the one hand, you have China, which has an emperor for life, and then you have the United States, which is laissez-faire. And when you have those extremes and then all the diversity in between, it's always going to be difficult, which is why multinationals are always frustrating to Americans. We have dozens of countries around the world who are at least open to and prepared to, to, to work with us. China d d does not have that for the most part. So I don't look at these institutions as somehow biased against the United States. And, and even in those occasions where they might be, that to me is a challenge for foreign policy. How within them do we build coalitions? That's why God invented diplomats. Let us not fail to grasp this supreme chance to establish a worldwide rule of reason, to create an enduring peace under the guidance of God. Today, the Allied world salutes these representatives of 50 nations. They have made a beginning, a brave beginning, that can build a mighty structure for peace. When World War II ended, the U.S. championed the formation of the global order we know today. The United States was the architect of so many of these multinational organizations. You know, they came out of, in, in so many ways, a devastated world in 1945 uh, and a belief by Americans that the way to avoid catastrophic wars in the future was to create international institutions that were basically channels for dialogue and problem solving. That was a very different world, a very different United States. Balance of power, distribution of power was far different. These institutions now have 75 years of a track record, not always, shall we say, glorious. Even as the US government embraced multilateralism, a strong undercurrent of skepticism ran through American politics. I just say the hell with the US. What is it anyway? The U.S. can afford to be much more self-sufficient and independent than just about any other nation in the world. America always kind of stood a little bit to a side on these things, and it was given the permission to do that because most Western nations thought, look, we don't mind if America does its own stuff now and again, uh, as long as it's inside the multilateral institutions where we need it to be. 
Well, I suggested on the floor of the Senate today that we stop all funds for the United Nations. Now, what that'll do to the United Nations, I don't know. Uh, I have a hunch it would uh, cause them to fold up, which would make me very happy at this particular point. Well, in the United States, uh, like in Australia and other Western democracies, it becomes an item of political sport, particularly within the political right and far right, to just go on a general campaign of UN bashing. Why do politicians do that? It's because this attack on globalism, this uh, straw man argument, uh, has become a part of the identity politics of the right and the far right. Globalism exerted a religious pull over past leaders, causing them to ignore their own national interests. Today, the world looks very different from the circumstances of 1945. It is not so easy for bureaucratic institutions to evolve rapidly to face new challenges. It's gonna be very hard to see those organizations change. It's not that people don't know how they should change. It's that the major powers that comprise these institutions have to be prepared to bring their publics along. There's no magic wand that can be waved by the citizenry uh, on their own or by the secretary general or by any particular country. What is the point of pretending that the organization is still committed to its original uh, principles? Uh, and if that tension means that the organizations don't work, as many parts of the UN system didn't work during the Cold War, that's unfortunate, but then that ought to lead people to say, what are the alternatives? Not just keep plowing along as if the problem didn't exist. You have seen over the history of the UN a surprising degree of innovation in looking at new ways to solve problems as they confront them. Something like peacekeeping was not in the UN Charter. The UN invented it when they had to in the middle of the Suez Crisis in 1956. So there are all kinds of ways that the UN working with partners needs to look at solutions in innovative ways. When organizations depend on consensus, a member state that refuses to live up to its commitments can spark frustration and recrimination. In the early days of the WTO, we tried to operate uh, fully by consensus. We're now at 164 members, and deciding every single thing by consensus has become unmanageable. So what members are doing, they are figuring out how to advance the most sensitive issues. Flexibility is the only way I think uh, the WTO can continue to upgrade itself in a, in a progressive and quick enough manner. To the extent that international organizations deal with political issues, you're going to see uh, further gridlock as the member states disagree. And you saw this during the Cold War when the United States and the Soviet Union were often at odds. The staunchest defenders of the multilateral order insist that institutions are merely forums where member states can interact. It is up to those individual countries to learn to cooperate. There is no other forum where this is going to disappear. Uh, whatever forum, whatever setup you design, uh, you're still going to have different opinions. It's not changing the name of the forum or the place of the forum or the countries that are inside the forum that it's going to change the outcome. Richard Holbrook used to say about the UN that blaming the UN for a crisis is like blaming Madison Square Garden when the New York Knicks play badly. When are we gonna get the kinds of reforms of these organizations that we need to make them fit for purpose in the 21st century? When the governments that comprise UN bodies are willing to back those reforms. Throughout American history, policymakers have feared that the empowering of international institutions might impinge on national sovereignty. I, I do not recognize higher law than the Constitution in temporal terms. I'm leaving religion out of this. We are sovereign, uh, and the Constitution provides uh, no opportunity to delegate that sovereignty uh, to some international body. 
My own view is that there's a false dichotomy that's often created between sovereignty and cooperation. One of the best ways to advance the sovereign interests of any country, including the United States, is by working with allies, working with other partners where you share common interests. And that's really how these institutions were created and what they're for. Today, politicians who worry about the loss of sovereignty have mounted fierce opposition to American participation in the International Criminal Court, a tribunal founded in 2002 to prosecute individuals for crimes against humanity. I've said before, the happiest day of my entire government career was the day that I unsigned the Clinton administration's signature on the Rome Statute creating the ICC. I think it's a thoroughly illegitimate institution. We don't recognize any international authority uh, to judge American citizens. We judge American citizens. I received word this morning that the ICC Appeals Chamber authorized an investigation into the activities of the Taliban and U.S. and Afghan personnel there. This is a truly breathtaking action by an unaccountable political institution masquerading as a legal body. Our nation and this administration will not allow American citizens who have served our country to be subjected to illegitimate investigations. There are, I think, real and legitimate concerns about the International Criminal Court and about its jurisdiction and how it could be used to affect American diplomats, American uh, service men. And the ICC was not designed for situations where a country had a, a robust legal system. Those who champion global institutions face an urgent question. How to present an effective case for multilateralism to skeptical voters. The key challenge for any national political leadership uh, is on matters of uh, global governance to explain to their domestic political constituencies our membership uh, of these international institutions, primarily in terms of their ability to advance our domestic national interests, and then you argue, and by the way, it helps the world as well. The challenge with a narrow form of nationalism, a kind of insularity of worldview that leads you to believe that you can close your borders and solve your problems, is that the facts are not going to respect that ideology or that way of governing. We're not going to set back the clock, right? You're not going to see the end of global air travel or the end of global commerce. The good news is, compared to 1945, we've got democracies on every continent. We have nations that are moving more and more toward respect of, of democratic values. But we also have democracies that are stressed. The authoritarian nations in the world moved into a new chapter of trying to promote the idea that authoritarian uh, governance models are the right ones for the 21st century. I think we have to rebut that critique, not just by trying to be a strong democracy in the United States, but by pulling democracies of the world together. Those non-Americans who have observed the shifting attitudes of the U.S. government most closely are optimistic that multilateral organizations can function effectively even without U.S. participation. I watch very carefully the World Health Assembly, which is the highest decision-making body of the WHO. The European Union was the one that was stepping forward and proposing, really sort of drafting all of the key decisions. Um, that's a role that historically, I think, the United States often had. But with the US absent, it was Europe that was able to bridge the different gaps. I've called for like-minded countries uh, in Europe, in Asia, and in the Americas to triage the institutions of multilateral governance until we re-establish a level of um, uh, geopolitical equilibrium between China and the United States. The ball, I think, well and truly lies uh, in the court of uh, an incoming Biden administration. But I do think this is the last chance saloon for American global leadership. It may be that we'll look back again at this and say the idea that you need a country to lead us out of a crisis is a very 20th century notion and that uh, leadership has become much more fragmented, diverse, as has power. Uh, and therefore, we shouldn't be expecting America or any country to come up and lead. Since 1945, the world has learned that multilateralism is messy, tedious, frustrating, and imperfect. Partnerships form, 
and dissolve and institutions come and go. But at a time when emerging threats can so easily cross borders, the nations of the world have little choice but to find some way to work together. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion program on global affairs. Discussion groups meet online via Zoom and Google Meets, in person at community centers, libraries, places of worship, and homes across the country to discuss global issues with their community. Participants read the eight-topic briefing book, meet to discuss each topic, and complete a ballot which shares their views with Congress. To start or join a discussion group in your community, visit fpa.org or call 1-800-477-5836. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation.